about how if you were a farmer on Mars, you'd be seeing UFOs. But basically, we have spy vehicles. And what this is, is this is one of the actual rovers. You know, it has a camera and a drill and various other sensory devices. And it's reporting back on what it sees. Now, if I wanted to spy on the torque in that room, it would be pretty easy. I could stick a camera on a radio controlled car and I could send it around and you know, it might get some funny looks in that room, but it would be able to do its job. But there's a big problem with doing this for Mars, which is that of time. If you think about the distance to Mars, I mean, even in the moon landings, there were delays in transmission. Neil Armstrong would say his, his portentous words that he'd rehearsed for weeks, and then there'd be a delay until it was acknowledged by, by Houston. Um, once you get the distance of Mars, this becomes a, a significant problem, particularly because the distance changes. Um, when Earth and Mars are far apart, I, I can't remember numbers, but the, the, distance is certain, the, the time lag for a radio signal is certainly in the order of several minutes. So you can't just radio control your thing around. What they had to do instead was set up a rover that can run more or less automatically. So it goes back to what I was saying about the Roomba, that this thing isn't able to just be completely independent. It's not like, you know, James Bond behind enemy lines that will go off for weeks and gather information and finally report back. It's, it's given instructions at least daily. But instead of being move forward one centimeter and then turn right five degrees, they will be moved towards the edge of this crater and take pictures and these are the kinds of rocks we're interested in when you see one drill out some samples. And it has a controller that uses the subsumption ideas, the subsumption architecture ideas that Rodney Brooks is, is famous for, where at the highest level it has, okay, I, I want to get 100 meters northwest. Below that, there's things like obstacle avoidance, um, various behaviors to avoid it getting stuck. And with that, we, we have things that are much more useful than the radio control car because it only needs to connect um, asynchronously. It can get a batch of instructions and send back a batch of data. One thing you might notice after anything I was saying about wheels is that this is another wheeled robot. The, the ultimate Mars rover, well, so the ultimate Mars rover would actually be an astronaut, but the, the ultimate Mars rover robot would be one with legs. And, and there are such things under development. There's, there's quite cool work going on at the moment with, with robots that can scramble across rough terrain. But it's too, it's too new at the moment. They're not reliable enough. Um, we're still learning how to control these things. So that's why it's not used yet. But I expect to see leg Mars rovers in my lifetime. Now another project that actually a friend of mine did for, for his masters was credit scoring. Now, if you, if you go and apply for a loan, um, it can be quite a complicated decision whether to get the first loan or not. Now, it isn't necessarily. If, if I apply for a loan, I already know that the bank will tell me, you haven't lived in the US for long enough, insufficient history and a social security number, deny. And there are other people who are obvious good credit and will always be given pretty much what they ask for. It's, it's the cliche of needing to have money to be able to borrow. But for everything in between, it's a fuzzy decision. There, there isn't a clear rule that can be applied. And this, this may match some of your experience. There, there are certainly people who would apply at different banks, and some would give them loans, some wouldn't. Or, or some would give them preferential rates of interest, some would charge them a lot. So it's depending, it's depending on a relatively subjective assessment of risk. And that subjectivity is a problem. This is an area where the, the demand for automation isn't so much for efficiency. It's because of cases where people will cry out, but that wasn't fair. You only denied me a loan because X. I, I know back in Britain, the controversial thing has been credit scoring by district, where you get problems that because there's a few people who've defaulted on loans in that particular set of council housing, no one else at that address can borrow money anymore. Um, and this doesn't really resolve the problem, but if you use a computer, it's very convenient for, for the banks to be able to point to a computer system and say, ah, but the system said so. It's applying the rules, and it would have said the same thing whoever made the application based on that data. Whereas with a person, there are always possible accusations of bias. 
But because it's, it's basically mirroring what a person does, what they found was that you, you couldn't write down the rules. If you, if you try and get a bank manager to write down, okay, so what are the rules that say whether someone gets a loan or not? That system, based on those rules, will, will give out more bad debt and refuse more good, more good creditors than the bank manager would. So to try and capture the human judgment, they, they set up a neural network system, which was trained using real data. So the thing about neural networks is that basically they do whatever kind of pattern classification you train them to on examples. So in this case, it would be given a whole set of, of people, and the person would have a load of data associated. And with that person, it would say, loan granted at interest rate X for amount of money Y, or application declined. And over time, it could add things like, this person has defaulted. So it has a way of learning from its mistakes, because it gets, it gets input back. And basically, it's trained to make the same decisions as the person. One big problem with, with this kind of system is you can't necessarily make it any better than the person. But you can at least make it as good and consistent. Now on the same kind of theme as the, the loans, there are all kinds of natural phenomena that are in principle predictable, but difficult to predict, which we can apply this to. So the examples I've got, I'll just take, talk you through the pictures. We have a kid playing with his own heart. Um, this obviously is after he's had a transplant. Uh, we have Hurricane Isabel. Those of you who are local might remember Hurricane Isabel as bringing lots of rain. But if you lived in Florida, it was of much greater importance. And thinking back to this past hurricane season, it would have been very useful for Floridians to have a better idea of where each of those hurricanes that hit them was going to hit so that they could know which towns need to be evacuated, which towns don't need to worry, and, and so on. The aftermath of the earthquake in Istanbul about 10 years ago, um, that one's close to my heart because my grandmother lives there and she was actually stuck in her house because something had basically fallen onto the doorway. So she was stuck for a day. And the eruption of Mount St. Helens. I think this is from the big one in the early 80s. But earlier this year, Mount St. Helens was active. You know, the, the rock was rising, there was steam coming out, it was venting. And there was some speculation of, you know, what do we do for our next eruption? But the problem is, these things are all very hard to predict. So what heart failure and storms and earthquakes and volcanoes all have in common is that although they're difficult to predict, they're not random. Um, they're not even, in the strictest sense of the word, chaotic. They're just very complicated and controlled by things that we don't yet understand very well as scientists. So we can apply things like neural networks to these, because the neural network just trains to fit a pattern. It doesn't need to, quote, understand in the, um, you know, in the, well, I guess in the philosophical sense. And, and understanding is a really big minefield philosophically. But, but the system doesn't need to have some notion of. Oh, I forgot to put the picture credits up. Um, it, it doesn't need to have some notion of. Well, this is why the hurricane will hit this town and not that one. It, it's enough that it just draws out the pattern and says, this is what the pattern is leading to. The neural networks are, are very useful for all those kind of predictions. And finally, more relevant to here, I want to talk a little bit about, about computer security. I wish I could remember who did this, but there used to be a Taliban website back when the Taliban was the government of Afghanistan. And one day, I went to have a look at it, because it's always fascinating seeing what these kind of people say about themselves. And what I saw was this. So obviously, somebody has hacked that. And I don't really care if somebody hacks Taliban.af. You know, I, I have little enough time for what was supposed to be there that actually I was more amused by this than bothered by what I couldn't read. But anybody who, who runs any kind of computer system has this basic problem of security, which other people have talked about at, at Noscon as well, where there's always a conflict between keeping out people you don't want to have access to the system without shutting out those who you do or making life too difficult for those who you do. And the, the modern AI approach to this is to look at something like the human immune system, 
which has to do essentially the same task. If you think about um, autoimmune diseases, what's gone wrong there is that suddenly the immune system is attacking cells that you do want there. So it's got to make the distinction again between these are the welcome cells and these are the unwelcome cells. So people are trying to apply this. There, there is a thing called an artificial immune system, which is basically another kind of classifier that, that tries to roughly model how, how the immune system works. And, and again, make that wanted, unwanted distinction. And if you could make that reliably all the time, you could just shut off connections to all the unwanted traffic and, and reduce the hurdles all the wanted traffic has to go through. At the same time, if you can do that without human supervision, well, your, your system means get to sleep at night, which is obviously a bonus, and the system is more reliable. So hopefully that's given you an idea of some of the practical applications that these things currently go to. You know, it's not robots that walk and talk, but actually there are some pretty cool and pretty useful things. And now I'll pass you back on Sean to talk about the, the other side of this transfer, which is what pure science research gets out of us making all these models and playing with them. <laughs> all right, as Alvin just said, I mean, basically, how does this return all these basically technologically inspired or biologically inspired tools, technical or technological tools, what does it bring back to the life sciences? I'm going to give three examples, one from cognitive science, one from evolutionary developmental biology, and then one from neuroethology. And this is Eldon's work, actually, in the cognitive science area that he's done recently. And the object, or basically, traditionally, it's been a very symbolic approach to understanding cognition. And recently, there's been this surge of this situated, embodied, and dynamical approaches to understanding these thought processes. And so what Ellen has been working on is basically creating an agent represented down here, basically that performs a selective attention task. It has to or catch each of these two falling objects, okay? And it has basically just vision with these rays, and it catches these by moving back and forth. And he's basically implemented this using a neural network, very small number of neurons for this, and a genetic algorithm to set the parameters for this. And this task is you know, it's minimally cognitive, as I've indicated out by that, basically, that this is a difficult enough task that's of interest to basically researchers in the cogn or, you know, in cognition. And then through understanding the dynamics of the neural networks, you get an understanding of how this thought process works. So, and Ellen has a nice video. Whoops. Mm -hmm. There, I must have tapped it. It worked earlier. There it is. Thanks, all. It's on the screen. You see it scanning in and basically collecting the other object. Now again, this is a selective attention task, basically where sometimes it moves out of range of the other ball, has to remember that I need to go and catch this other one out here. So again, it seems relatively simple, but it's of genuine interest to the researchers in this area. And again, being that it has such a small number of neurons, you can actually get in and look at the neural dynamics and gain some understanding of this, what you think of a higher process. Okay. Briefly, there are the evolutionary developmental biology example, Evo Devo for short. And so earlier I pointed out this modern evolutionary theory showing the two components of genetics and natural selection. Well, I left this space out and recently people are noticing that development is crucial to understanding this. This is like the middle process that's going on. Basically, how do these developmental processes affect the evolution of organisms? And in my own work, I'm investigating how basically developmental bias might affect evolvability. By evolvability, I mean the ability of these organisms to find good solutions and continue to find good solutions to ecological problems. I mean, how do you find mates? And basically, how do you, over time with coevolution, are able to solve these problems? And I'm saying that developmental bias, that is this bias in the production of variants of different forms and behaviors, results in evolvability. I have two examples here, one population and showing this circle represents the distribution of variants, and that it's pretty you know, uniform, it's non-biased. 